the format that we are going to have is we've already decided on a couple of questions uh, and the panel is going to have a uh, go at uh, questions some some of the questions will be led by individuals who have more expertise or who are more near to that particular subject area uh, we will keep a watch on the chat so if there is time we will start bringing your questions from the chat but we will try and incorporate your suggestions as we discuss um, through this one hour now this one hour is a small it's a short time uh, uh, so we are going to try and pack in as much as we can uh, and we're hoping that um, uh, we should be able to do something similar uh, in the in the near future so um, to begin with i'm just going to quickly say a short statement about CILT in case people are new to CILT. So CILT is the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, uh, is a membership organization for professionals in logistics, supply chain, and transport fields. It's first established in 1919, and uh, it's a registered charity with, uh, you know, with a 33,000 member strong uh, commitment across the world. So if you are um, not members of CILT and new to this, please have a look at the website. And if you're interested, you can uh, join CILT. It's a very fruitful um, uh, engagement. <clears throat> and so just to uh, kind of uh, begin this, uh, a quick introduction by the panel. So everybody's going to have a chance to tell us who they are and how what they're bringing into this discussion. So let's start with Richard. Ah, thank you, Samir. And thanks for inviting me onto the panel today. I've just spun through the attendee list. There's some uh, lots of familiar familiar names there. If you don't know me, my name's Richard Gibson. I've been in the logistics industry all my working life. Probably spent about half of it with customers, half of it with service providers, and worked my way through food, extractive industries, and latterly healthcare, covering most areas from um, driving all the way through uh, up to network operations. Um, and I'm particularly keen on, on today's discussion because it, it really encompasses this, this um, EU, uh, UK domestic, international piece. I've spent a lot of time uh, working and, and running European and international networks. I'm looking forward to some of, the, some of the discussion and questions later. My current operation and sphere of responsibility is EU um, healthcare and managing flows in and out from China and the US across a range of modes. So I'm looking forward to uh, to the next hour, Samir, thank you. Thank you, Edward. Edward, you'll need to unmute. It's much better on mute, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Samir, um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you, Samir, for your kind invite to uh, join this panel. Uh, I'm uh, Abe Sweeney. Uh, I'm based at Aston University here in Birmingham. Uh, at Aston, I lead the Aston Logistics and Systems Institute, which is our specialist multidisciplinary team uh, working in all facets really of, of supply chain. Uh, our key sort of focal areas are around sustainability, uh, around the effective deployment of technology in supply chains. Uh, around the application of systems thinking, so we do things in a much more joined up and integrated fashion. And my background uh, covers um, industry uh, and business, but I've spent a lot of my career over the last 30 years working really uh, on the interface between business and academia. So uh, I look forward to engaging in today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. John? Thanks very much, Samir. Uh, yeah, John Manners Bell. I'm uh, chief executive of uh, TI Insight, a uh, market uh, research uh, company based here in the UK, but covering all the all the world. My background before that, which I established about uh, well, 20 years ago now, was uh, in the logistics industry, starting off as uh, operations in a small freight forwarding come road company in the southeast of England, and then uh, after a few years, uh, leaving that and uh, becoming uh, well, moving into a marketing and strategic role with UPS on the supply chain uh, so solutions business. Uh, since then, i am also become an honorary visiting professor at the London, London uh, Guildhall Business School. 
and I also advise the World Economic Forum. And I think the work I've done with the World Economic Forum has been, was, is very apposite to this con uh, conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, because we've been covering risk for the last 10 years and plus, probably longer than that, and uh, everything that uh, we're going to be talking about today in the terms of mitigation of risk and resilience is, uh, is going to be uh, very useful for this, dis uh, use useful for this discussion. Okay. Thank you, John. Liam? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Samir, for inviting me on this panel today. My name is Liam Fassam, Associate Professor of Food Supply Chain at Northampton University, and also the director of the Institute of Logistics and Supply Chain. My key research areas around food and fraud and provenance and systems views with that. Um, much like Richard, I have a checkered background in logistics and supply chain where I've done everything from driving a truck up to board level. So I bring a, an academic and business perspective to the, to the challenges. Excellent, thank you. So with that introduction, we jump to the first question. Uh, and this is f for everybody, if they're going to go quickly through uh, all of you with the answers. So in your opinion, uh, was the logistics sector prepared to cope with the sudden COVID challenge? Uh, what adjustments were required to work through this challenge? So anybody start and then we'll go through everybody's answers. Richard? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll kick off then. Um, great question. Thank you. Um, I think you'd have to have had your head buried in the sand not to realise this was going to hit. Um, I was looking at my diary back at the end of January. I was back in, uh, I was in the States at, uh, at a conference and, and the Chinese team couldn't join because they were in lockdown. And at that point, week five, um, the clock was ticking until week 12 when um, the pandemic storm rolled through Europe and a lot of our normal ways of moving things around just disappeared um but the the, the issue for for me uh, in the organization I, I work in at the moment as well as for other organizations is okay you can see it coming but how much cash do you put behind putting in a solution and um during those key weeks in in march whatever you might have planned was often uh, ripped up as we started dealing with force majeure um, issues on service providers. So that's when you get into the discussion around black swans, grey swans, white swans, anybody who's dealt with SARS and the day-to-day -day interruptions in supply chain is used to um, being agile and thinking on their feet. It was the magnitude of this change that I think caught out most people in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of adjustments, my adjustments have been around uh, a different style of communication and leadership throughout the organization and recognizing those phases of the immediate um, requirement to uh, uh, be alert and contain and look after your people, um, defining the response and then getting into recovery. Um, and we'll talk about recovery, I'm sure, later on, because I don't think we're through it yet, um, but let's see where the discussion goes. And I never forget this industry is one, of the, is one of those industries where we have to have people on the ground picking products and driving trucks. Um, and I take my hat off to um, those colleagues who weren't able to work from home and had to um, continue to attend site, albeit in some very strained circumstances. So um, what was, the, was the logistics sector prepared? I, I think we knew something was happening, but I think the magnitude might have shocked us. And the adjustments for me and, and a lot of the people I, I work with are really about managing people through the process. Thank you. Ed? Uh, yes, thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, was the supply chain profession prepared? Uh, I, agree with, uh, I agree with Richard. I think the sheer magnitude of the challenge meant that um, prepare, levels of preparedness just couldn't have been uh, ideal. Uh, did the supply chain profession respond very well to the challenges, the unprecedented challenges that it faced? I think yes. Um, we've got to remember as well that this has been a tale of two different elements. Um, on the one hand, and I, I remember talking to colleagues about this about two months ago, I remember in one particular morning, I spoke to a senior uh, supply chain professional from one of the big third party operators feeding product into the retail multiples 
so working in the food supply chain, and she had never been as busy in her whole career um, because we saw this incredible spike in demand. Uh, we saw this uh, situation where people began to stockpile particular products. Uh, toilet rolls, of course, became emblematic of, of that particular period. Uh, and, and supply chains were put under um, incredible levels of, 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 of pressure. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, I remember on that exact same day, I was speaking to a senior supply chain professional in the automotive industry. And his industry had literally begun to come to a standstill uh, at that point as a direct result of, of plant closures um, here in the UK and elsewhere. So I, I, I think depending on which sectors we look in, we're seeing completely different challenges. But when I look at the logistics sector and I look at the wider supply chain profession, uh, what I see is an incredible um, agility and level of responsiveness uh, that makes me, for one, feel proud to be part of this profession. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John? Yeah, I think I'd pick up on some of the things which Ed have said there. I think uh, it, the, this whole crisis has been a showcase for the logistics industry in terms of showing off its uh, agility, uh, innate flexibility as well in the way it's been able to uh, respond to this particular crisis. Uh, and I think we'll pick up on some of the, the points that, that has impacted different sectors in very different ways. Uh, and we've seen that at the beginning of the crisis, there was a huge peak in a surge in terms of consumer goods with people panic buying. And I think the logistics uh, industry as a whole did really well during that period of time to actually meet that, that those peaks of demand. I think testament to that really is the fact that nobody's gone hungry. The shelves were kept uh, um, packed at the, at the beginning of the day anyway, or you see the media pictures showing what they were like at the end, but the very next morning they'd be full again. And uh, so I think the logistics industry did a fantastic job to keep those deliveries uh, going and the fulfillment uh, going as well. But it's come at quite a big cost. And I think we're already starting to see uh, with some of the, the figures which are being released from some of those logistics companies, they've been able to adapt. They were able to move capacities from one sector from, for example, construction or from uh, automotive into uh, consumer goods. But that's come at a cost. And I think uh, that it's, it's significantly expensive to undertake that sort of, uh, those sort of operations. And uh, so um, there will be a payback in the coming few months or so. But overall, I think uh, the industry did, did really very, very well in which to respond to the crisis. Thank you, Liam. There's not really much more to add. I suppose the, the key thing here is the, the food sector. If we look at the, what we're talking about today and how that responded, if we look at the whole food service sector completely shut down and within a week, whole food service manufacturing facilities were able to turn their operations around and, and, and uh, through a period of skew rationalisation, build retail supply chains to do exactly what John's talking about. And that's not run out of food, which is quite important to work out, uh, consider when we think of the logistics industry uses a lot of air freight to move food around the world. We haven't got those empty shelves that John's alluded to, and we had a 95% reduction in air freight capacity. So, it's, it, it's a, so it just it demonstrates a significant amount of agility that we have in our profession. Yeah, true. I, I, think, I think the whole aspect of how quickly the logistics industry could respond to uh, of the, the issues of both stockpiling and shortages, um, I think has been um, very, very clearly demonstrated. And the fact that then the logistics industry turned out to be one of the key professions to keep the country running, I think has, has done a great advantage anyway to that. So uh, th thanks for that. And, and going back then to this whole issue that because there was, there was this kind of sudden onslaught of uh, demand for, for the supermarket sector and, uh, and, and the whole aspect of uh, uh, human behavior in, in terms of such a panic situation. Uh, do you think then uh, that the logistics system has been resilient to counter the challenges of both shortage and stockpiling um, uh, through this system? And I'm going to start with Liam because I think the food sector was clearly the most uh, uh, important one to be hit right at the start. Of course, toilet paper was, but uh, I think food uh, runs through as a, as a key element through society anyway. I think, I think it coped really well. I mean, everyone here is, 
mention sort of anecdotal things. In, uh, I can't remember if it was Richard or Ed mentioned toilet, toilet paper gate um, and all, all the, the media storms of empty shelves, which actually exacerbated the problems that we had in the retail sector. So we had this perfect storm of capacity not being able to meet demand. And everyone just thought there wasn't enough food. There was loads of food. It was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the amazing thing about the supply chain, and I feel incredibly proud to be associated with it, is it took a matter of days for it to, to smooth out. And there were some things that they've done, and we, there's some really interesting stuff. And I'll be in to see the post-COVID food supply chain and what it looks like. A lot of the supermarkets now have gone through this skew rationalization process. And they said, yes. we don't actually need 52 different types of tomato ketchup. I'm picking on that unfairly. But we'll rationalize this down to 14. Is this going to, human behaviors, will it change the way we shop? Will we revert back to these large hundreds of thousands of skew models that have arguably caused some of the problems that we see with the empty shelves? Mm -hmm. Anybody else wants to pitch in? I just maybe, Samir, like to, to, to come in and make the point and um, following on directly from, from um, uh, the point made by Liam that we have learned an important lesson, which is you can't confuse capacity uh, with supply chain capability. Um, we, for, for example, we've seen this very clearly in the situation with PPE in, in, in the NHS. Uh, we're beginning to see it now in, in the context of uh, testing, uh, COVID testing capabilities. And mm -hmm. that's really important because uh, more widespread testing is clearly going to be an important part of the exit strategy as we look towards the future. And we hear a lot in the media, don't we, about we have X amount of capacity, but, but that's not really the problem. The problem is making sure that that capacity reaches the right place at the right time. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not just about having capacity somewhere in the network. It's about making sure we have the supply chain capability to get that product to the right place at the right mm -hmm. time, which is fundamentally what logistics and supply chain uh, management is, is about. Yes. So I, I think with food, there was another shortage at that time with paracetamol uh, because everybody wanted to have a stock of paracetamol at home. And, and if, from a healthcare perspective, um, we did find from, from, again, a logistics perspective that the movement of certain medicines had stopped. Um, do you have anything to say, Richard, in, because your background is more healthcare and uh, whether you have found any certain chinks in, in there in terms of that logistics system? Um, yeah, so uh, health, healthcare, um, of course, is uh, encompasses a, a number of areas: um, diagnostics, ophthalmics, devices, stents, hip replacements, knee replacements, vaccines, and medicines. All of which have been in varying demand through the pandemic. Um, I remember the early days where you couldn't get hold of Nurofen, then you could get hold of Nurofen, um, and if you look into those supply chains, they um, were stressed um, and they were having to explore different routes to bring the product into Europe which were by and large successful and uh, there was a lot of collaboration there with other manufacturers um, and on the other side of, of, of the healthcare equation some some demand has dropped off because uh, patients um, may not want elective surgery at this time um, a lot of clinics have been closed at this time, so demand for some drugs has has fallen away. Um, so it's been it's been very interesting to watch organisations come together and collaborate to get their product in, and mm -hmm. to plan supply of product into um, uh, some of the key healthcare channels. Right, Liam, you had something to say? Yeah, just well, Claire's come up with a really good point well, well, in the in the question there about food systems post-recovery. We're, we're quite good at talking about what, not in this panel, but in, in the media, quite good at talking about what happened. We're not really talking about what will happen. And she, she, she's asking like, what will the return to the food system look like? And that's quite salient because as we fragmented from retail and food, food service, when Boris decides we're going to start opening up pubs, yes, and restaurants, how will we reconverge and switch this supply chain back on? Will we just end up with this capacity problem that Ed alluded to, or will, will we be able to have systems that can actually bring this in nice and smoothly without causing issues? Right. Uh, thank you. John, do you want to add something? 
Well, I was just uh, following up from Liam's point of what's it going to look like in the future. And I think we'll we'll probably talk a little bit about e-retail later on. But that's been yeah. one of the uh, one of the standout uh, uh, things that we'll all remember, I think, of uh, for this particular crisis, the way that e-retail really has uh, has stepped up. And uh, given that this is a, to large populations have been in lockdown you know this is this has been uh, it's been incredible that the way that people have been able to still uh still shop but do it online rather than physically and i, I think the way that um the online has moved into the grocery sector will, will be very important for the future of uh, of grocery retailing and the supermarkets uh, as we move forward as well as other sectors of course but i think for for grocery retailing this this could be a uh, a real step change in in terms of the, um, the development of that particular distribution channel. Yeah, thank you. So in, in terms of the challenges that we're discussing, there's a couple of points from um, the audience also, uh, from people attending. This is a question about different uh, uh, setups in different countries. And, and of course, from there's a question on India and how, uh, you know, it was a complete lockdown and the, and the kind of, uh, laborers migrated back to the villages they had come from and, and there's a reverse migration happening. They were stuck in place. Now, uh, from that perspective, there has always been an issue uh, in, in terms of where the lockdown is as severe. In the UK, uh, it has been identified that logistics supply chains were key uh, professions and, and, and this has been out and about and things have been working. Um, but of course, not in places like India to that extent with everything was in lockdown. Um, and uh, there has been certain kind of uh, support from the government anyway. So there's another question on bureaucracy uh, in terms of uh, red tape and stuff. So I think from a healthcare perspective, food perspective, we have seen a little bit of, uh, you know, changes within that process because you had to expedite and get get uh, things in place to, on, on the supermarket shelves or so. But of course, we've seen with the ventilator and stuff that although there were things in place or the PPE was in place, the logistics had moved it, had brought it in place, but uh, it was not certified or it was not up to the right quality. So uh, logistics functions can do certain things very, very effectively. But of course, if the product is not of the right category, then of course, it's not going to work out. So going back to that, then, then this leads into the next question. And I'm going to first... Uh, ask John to think about it, but in terms of the solutions, what do, what can we do to to kind of make this more efficient, effective? You know, where does technology play a role into this situation? Have you seen any examples of technology being, uh, you know, uh, brought to the fore in trying to manage this? Because Paul asked a question from the audience again in terms of uh, where is technology, or is is technology going to change the way logistics works in the future? Well, the way, the way I see it, Samir, is that, that the coronavirus on its own will not lead to a, um, a necessarily a, a paradigm shift in the, way that, uh, in the way that technology is used within the logistics and supply chain, but it will be, uh, cause a, a considerable acceleration of its, uh, the adoption of different technologies. I think some people in the industry are, are saying that, uh, for example, on the retail side of things, that, uh, that we've moved forward five years in the last uh, in the last two months. So I see there's, there's really going to be a, a very strong acceleration in adoption rather than actually new solutions being developed. And I think one of the areas uh, particularly will be in the adoption of automation, and I think that's one of the uh, other questions which has come up. Do we think uh, do we think we're going to be seeing more automation? I think the answer has to be yes, because uh, at the same time as uh, workforce is being a considerable asset for many uh, warehouse operations, um, they are as well going to be seen as a considerable risk in the coming few few years either if coronavirus uh, crops up again or whether we have some other sort of pandemic. And the now we have the capa capabilities through automation, uh, we are going to see a lot more investment in whether it's materials handling or whether it's uh, robotics in, within, the, within the warehouse. So I think that's, that's one area in which these uh, companies are going to be looking to gain more efficiencies. And um, 
Uh, on one hand, uh, we're also going to see a lot of free money floating about. We're going to see uh, governments give, give uh, large capital grants, I'm sure. We're going to see uh, quantitative easing, which is going to lead to long-term low interest rates. So there will be more money for investment in these sort of technologies, and these technologies are getting cheaper anyway. I suppose set against that, you also have the, uh, the unfortunate um, uh, prospects of large-scale unemployment over the next uh, couple of years, and that could slow down the the, the um, adoption of innovations such as automation because uh, labour forces will be will be cheaper than they are at the moment. But having said that, I do think that uh, automation is going to be one area, one technology which is going to be adopted um, uh, significantly over over the coming year or so. Uh, there are others, but maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll open it up to the panel to see what they think, and uh, I can come back with uh, some other points if, if need be. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wants to talk about technology automation? Yes, Liam. I think not so much automation. I think technology and data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that this has highlighted, particularly the food industry, is and my favourite stat, if we think about the food industry in Europe, 92% of the activity is undertaken by an SME. Now, with the divergence of retail and food service, and I'll go on about that all the time, a lot of the people that were supplying food service were unable to diversify into retail supply chains because they didn't have the connected technology and quality systems to meet and dovetail into those, those systems. So it's, it's highlighted a need for technology not to be your out-of-the-box turnkey SAP or Oracle multi-million pound system, but these need to go much further upstream down to the SMEs to enable more agile food supply chains and connectivity. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody else? Yes, Samir, can I, can I, can I just say, um, I agree with what um, John has said. I think um, we will likely see more automation I think what's more important than more automation is better, smarter automation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you know, it's a bit like um, the old uh, adage which, which said, if we have a bad process and we automate that bad process, what, what do we get? We get a slightly faster bad process. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think a lot of this has to be about sort of supply chain process re-engineering and thinking about the effective deployment of technology in that context. Yeah. I, I also think um, the point that Liam made is, is vitally important. I mean, the SMEs are the backbone of the supply chains. And if we're serious about things like improving, innovating processes through the effective deployment of technology, we've got to really pay some attention to what I refer to as the sort of innovation bandwidth uh, within smaller organizations. And I, I think that's, uh, that, that's something um, regional and national um, government could, could play a role in. And I mean, the final point on, on, on this for me is that, and we've seen this very vividly in recent, uh, in recent weeks, that you, you know, good supply chains depend on uh, the hardwiring, the infrastructure and the technology and all the rest of it, but they also critically depend on the, the softwiring, the people, the relationships, the skill base and so on. And it's making sure that we've got better integration between the kind of hardwiring and the softwiring. I think that's going to be a real critical success factor as we try to build these more resilient post-COVID supply chains. Absolutely. I, I think what, what's, what's shown us uh, uh, in, in terms of COVID-19 was the importance of human beings in the system. Um, and, and when human beings stop working, everything shuts down. And this has been unprecedented in the fact that the world shut down, uh, irrespective of uh, whether it, you know, the, the virus situation uh, prevailed in certain countries or not. But it, it, you couldn't just do dual sourcing or you couldn't just redesign your supply chains because there's nowhere to go. And, and, and that's been a, a key element for me uh, from the fact that we really need to start looking at the human beings in the system uh, in a different way and try to train them and, and, and get them working uh, and supporting them uh, with the right environment and infrastructure. So technology will have a role to play because, of course, with the UK, the industrial strategy, um, uh, you know, document and the made smarter documents, all of these bring out to four 
industry 4.0 etc but industry 5.0 is something that's going to come up with how humans and technology can kind of coexist and work effectively uh, in the future uh, but it also brings back to this point what rich uh, richard made about collaboration and i would suggest in in terms of richard do you want to speak more about the other variables because we have been talking about uh, technology being something very important uh, to manage this uh, situation but i'm sure there are other variables that we should be considering as as being important as well as uh, now and and the future yes uh, and thanks Samir. i'm just looking at some of some cracking questions coming in from from the audience here um about the application of technology um and so uh, the, the things i've seen as somebody who who looks after a great team working their way through this on an hour to hour basis has been the collaborative initiatives between customers that there, there comes a point with with the service provider group and i work with all of the top five where some just froze going through this process they just were not able to respond and some became stars and were very communicative agile available responsive um, and have developed business as a result and and they were great to work with um, because they found new and innov innovative ways of getting through um, but then there were also collaborative initiatives between customers so um, and I, I hasten to add I'm talking about um, activity outside of my current business that I'm aware of where customers have come together um, they're working in the same markets the commercial barriers have reduced because it is a pandemic um, and they've started working together and working uh, normally with charities at the center of it um, began uh, filling up planes finding planes and moving product and planning their product into market so it all, co it all comes back to you know the velocity visibility value um, who's going to enable these things to happen well, if you're a great service provider, just cannot do it, then you've got to do it yourself because you can't leave the patient um, without without the product. Um, so yeah, collaboration was a was a big one for me. I I would just like to say I think the EU road, EU mainland road freight has been superb during this process. I think those guys have done a wonderful job. And I hear horror stories of drivers driving across mainland Europe and turning up at customers and having to prove they've been tested. Um, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but they've persevered. And EU mainland road was the, has been the least of my problems. Um, air freight is the challenge, but we seem to have uh, got to a new normal. The one that's going to happen next, I suspect, is ocean freight. We've got a lot of new lanes appeared. Uh, PPE is dominating freight channels at the moment from China over to America. We're seeing new freight channels from America into China, particularly around important meat, equipment's in the wrong place, and, and uh, ocean freight uh, is, is at a, a bit of a, a changing point as well at the same time. But the, uh, just getting back to uh, uh, what you asked me to comment on, the collaborative piece I think has been excellent, Samir. It's been very impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there, there have been a couple of questions in terms of, uh, is there's one from Julian that's specifically asking in terms of uh, what's going to happen, uh, you know, when when the kind of lockdown opens up uh, in terms of the volumes, in terms of low consumer demand, whether supply chains will have the capacity uh, and, and are we going to lose any capacity in the system at that time. Uh, plus there have been some questions about uh, the last mile delivery and are we, um, you know, sure about uh, whether uh, this this is effectively uh, working? You know, the last mile delivery service. So, from from so the last mile delivery again is important from the aspect of understanding that consumer demand because if you know uh, consumer demand, you can plan out your last mile more effectively. So, do you think in the future, as as the lockdown opens up, we're going to have problems where? Uh, because the kind of they, I, I don't know whether you know Liam doesn't agree with the new normal situation. You know that is it a new normal? Is it is it the same normal? You know you don't know what's going to be. But uh, how how do you see see this thing opening up uh, after the lockdown? You know will logistics work exactly what it is now, or or it'll slightly uh, differ? There'll be a short term scenario and there'll be a long. Term. But uh, what do you think of the short term situation in terms of demand? Anybody? Yes, Liam. 
Right, it's not necessarily last mile related, but I, I'm sat in Germany at the minute and right. things are coming out of lockdown here. The only thing I can tell you is when I go for a run in the morning, I still see um, this wonderful thing called a, a rush hour. And I see lots of package cars going around delivery. So I think this romantic notion that we're going to stay working at home and there will be no capacity, I, I, it's, it's not being played out in Europe. It, things are starting to return to normal. Um, there, there will be casualties with this with some of the hauliers if we don't come out of furlough and we don't have a planned um, re reintegration of the, of the system. But it comes back to the SME piece I discussed yeah. earlier on. Yeah. I don't think we're going to have a whole new system. I think it comes back to something John said earlier on today. This isn't, you know, it's not going to be an immediate shift overnight towards automation, but it might be a slight gradual mindset shift, mindset shift towards the future systems that we put into place. Yeah. So going back to what Richard said that the ocean, ocean, you know, channels have opened up. Um, again, there's a lot of PP going through the system. Air freight also is talking about PP again. You know, PP is the is is the thing that's moving. Of course, with uh, related to safety and security of everybody. You know, even even the key workers in or key people within the logistics supply chain sectors need PPE technically. Um, as 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 this thing opens up and the new norm of um, you know, the short-term lockdown, whatever comes up. So apart from that, what, what's not being discussed, but although discussed in places like India, for example, um, because of the distances traveled, there, there's a lot of uh, focus on the rail industry and, and rail cargo, uh, rail corridor systems. And so within, within this pandemic situation, they have been using the rail uh, freight systems more uh, effectively. Uh, of course, UK, we don't have, you know, we have not talked anything about the rail industry. As we have talked about roads, we have talked about, to an extent, uh, aviation. Because we had questions coming in about the infrastructure and rail industry. Does, does the panel want to talk about or, or suggest something of what's happening with the rail sector or should be doing in the future? Again, with decarbonization, et cetera. Anybody? Richard? <laughs> thank, oh, John. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Sorry, for I'm putting you on the spot, but there have been a couple of questions from CILD members about the rail sector. Uh, I absolutely understand, and, and I, I absolutely understand rail uh, as a mode has a significant part to play in supply chain distribution. Uh, I'll just put it out there and I'll get some comments. $26 right. a barrel. It's right. cheaper and faster and more secure for us to move high sensitive, high value temperature control products on accompanied uh, vehicles around Europe. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, I have had experience of putting product on rail on the uh, on the China rail through to Europe. I put it on, and that particular customer took it off. Uh, it's all in healthcare. It's all around um, uh, customer service, security, quality, um, yep. and value. And uh, often with rail, ocean is a better proposition because obviously once the container's on the ship, it's not going to be tampered with. Um, so getting back to your question on rail, that is Richard's view. I apologize if it contradicts uh, other people in the audience, but it's good to have uh, perhaps a different viewpoint. Um, I, I think it, it works with distances also because, uh, you know, I know in India and Thailand, for example, rail corridors are, are a big thing right now. And there are um, big logistic cities being formed uh, from scratch along these new rail corridors, et cetera. So uh, it, it works because of the distances traveled uh, for, for cargo and, and freight. But of course, we haven't really discussed that much, although there is this whole strategy of decarbonization in the future and whether rail uh, is more uh, carbon free and so on and so forth. But I just put it out there because uh, the movement is movement at the end of the day. We have to make it more efficient, effective. And um, even from what we find in Africa or, or India, once the cargo lines up at the uh, rail station, you still need the last mile delivery or you still need the roads taking, uh, you know, there. Yes, Richard. Yeah. And, and uh, so Southeast Asia, you, you, you bang on different territory. Um, and in the two countries just referenced there, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, the road infrastructure is not what we're used to in Europe. Mm. So rail uh, is potentially an alternative. Um, however, the rail speeds are much lower than they are here as well. So there could be opportunity there, you know, uh, just normal stuff, low value, high bolt, plenty of it, yes. absolutely ideal for rail. Yes. Would you want to put a, you know, one and a half million dollar Siemens um, imaging machine on, on a rail in Vietnam? We probably want to think about that twice. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So, I, mean, I, I, I think it's um, I think it's horses for courses. Um, uh, you know, we I, I think rail freight will play an important role. Um, I think we're going to see some modal shift, but uh, we've got to look at every product and every industry and every scenario on its own merits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a bigger picture um, which we need to think about, which is I think we've learned a bit uh, about how to be more environmentally sustainable in our supply chains um, through the, 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 the challenges that we faced um, in, in, in recent weeks. And um, I, I, I suspect we're going to have a relatively a, a small window of opportunity as we unlock uh, from from the um, from the current situation as we transition to the new. Right. Yeah. Yes, Liam. I think we may, we we've we have lost Ed just, for a minute. Uh, am I back again? Yes. Now you're back. Yes. yes. Now I was just going to say that I think a lot of those um, good practices. That we've learned are really about how to work more collaboratively. Yes, yes. Liam, you had a you had a point. I think it's a. I think there's also been said about the sort of low value, high bulk thing, which is a really good point. I think there's rail could have played a bigger and still could play a big role in alternative strategies. A lot of the, a lot of the ports are starting to creak a little bit in terms of wrong type of container being in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. We saw rice imports in India being curtailed because of the congestion there. So that an overland bulking of dry goods like rice, wheat, mangoes this week are the latest one in India, can't export them because of ports. So bulk products like that, if the rail industry is agile enough, could be switched to, to go east-west. That's where I think the systems that Ed's talking about coming out need to have a bit of a rethink out what are our contingency plans going forward. And can the rail industry be agile enough as the, sh the shipping industry and aviation industry have been? Yeah. And Chris, Chris, has, Chris Pollock has made a great uh, comment on the chat. So if you can read that about the visibility of the rail freight in, uh, in, in terms of the COVID. But John, you had a... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I've just uh, got a, a sort of broader point, Samir, and uh, I think uh, Ed touched on it really. Uh, I, I think probably we've all seen the pictures of clear skies uh, over the last couple of months. We've all seen uh, the reduction in CO2 uh, emissions and uh, other pollution. On. And I think this is going to become a, a real political movement, uh, even more so than it was when, when we had the global climate emergency you know, the, at the end of last year. And uh, uh, I, I think once the lockdown's been lifted, I think the government's are going to come under a huge amount of pressure to push forward with environmental uh, policies. And that's going to have some real implications for the logistics industry. Mm -hmm. I can see that um, so diesel bans are going to be pushed, uh, pushed ahead uh, on an accelerated time scale, uh, I can can see uh, cities, you know, have go moving to become, uh, you know, obviously diesel free and whatever alternative uh, powered uh, engines are going to replace them to, to to be pushed forward or to or you know it will, some some solution is going to have to be found. Mm -hmm. That's going to have cost implications for the logistics industry. You, I can you can see that there will be. Uh, some sort of urban consolidation centres being built at the outs uh, at the outskirts of cities. There's going to be maybe micro, uh, hyper, uh, micro fulfilment centres being uh, developed within urban areas, and so consequently, uh, I don't think it's going to be business as normal for the logistics industry. I don't think the logistics industry will be, will be allowed. So consequently, we're going to have to look at different models, and and how rail plays out with that is is another question. But certainly uh, the industry uh, and investors in the industry and all stakeholders are going to have to come up with new ways of, of looking at distributing goods. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be that's going to have additional costs right the way through the industry, but also to uh, consumers. And that's it's going to be something that some that we're all going to have to deal with. Right. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to slightly change the track because um, Ed, Ed knows this very well. And I, I, I have the experience because as from, from a perspective of university education, uh, we do find that it's very, very difficult to get uh, students onto undergraduate programs in logistics and supply chain. Uh, whereas we know that the industry really uh, needs students. So uh, and the question is, is, is how do we 
as an industry you know we, there are a number of initiatives out there and ed will talk to us about the initiatives anyway i'm sorry ed on the spot but uh, how do we get six form students or even younger uh, children attracted to the industry and this is a kind of perennial question we face on on a kind of annual basis but how do we actually do this because now we've got logistics and supply chain in a very visible uh, in the pandemic situation everybody can see the importance of this function uh, this importance of this career so uh, ed uh, start start with you how, how do we how do we kind of increase this visibility how do we get more students into uh, these courses plus there's a question from one of the uh, audience that for fresh is now uh, how does the job market look like in in that sense so i think there are two different sides one is the entry of people into the course and then what's happening once they are come out of the course you know are there jobs available what do you think uh, let, let's perhaps talk about graduates first um and and this is sort of good news and bad news combined um the reality is and this is very very well documented we have a massive shortage uh, of business ready graduates in the supply chain area uh, here in the uk particularly but it's not a problem which is exclusive to the uk the net result of that is that uh, graduates coming out with the right blend of knowledge skills and and um, competencies uh, find it very very easy to secure very good employment whether it be in the logistics sector in retail or in manufacturing and indeed increasingly in policy making and consulting and so on the challenge really is at the other end of the um, university life cycle as you alluded to you know how, how can we make uh, our profession more attractive to 16, 17, 18 year olds. And this is something which, as you know, Samir, um, the Novus Trust, for example, part yes. of the CILT family has, has done some very, very good work in. But I, I think the big challenge really is to try to shift the image of logistics away from one which is a narrow one and a negative one. Uh, and the narrow negative one focuses very much on trucks and polluting trucks uh, and sheds, or often big sheds, um, and, and trying to shift away from that trucks and sheds image to one which to me has, has three big elements in it, all of which are very attractive to young people. One is logistics uh, is a globalized industry. And we who work in logistics and supply chain have known about globalization long before anyone else. So that idea of global connectivity, I think, is something which is an attractive feature of our profession for young people, particularly young people who grow up in a, in a smaller world, in a, in a much, in, in much more multicultural uh, environments and so on. Secondly, um, our supply chains of 2020 depend for their very existence on the effective deployment of very advanced technology. So when we're speaking to digital natives, when we're speaking to young people, that digital element of supply chain, that advanced technology aspect of logistics is a very important and attractive feature. And I think the final piece is the young people, in my experience, uh, have a much stronger level of awareness of the environmental challenges that we face, the kind of existential threat which environmental um, degradation represents. And, you know, we as supply chain professionals are playing a, an important role in, in terms of making sure that what we do is much more environmentally sustainable. So global connectivity, uh, advanced digital technology and environmental and sustainability, these are things which are important to young people. And I, I think it's incumbent on all of us to do what we can to shift the image away from the trucks and sheds and towards those sort of key, uh, key features. Yeah, anybody else from the panel? Yes, Liam. It, what Ed says is really struck the chord. Um, having done quite a few um, open day events and engaging with schools with my own university, one of the things that jumps off the page is a lot of the kiddies get this whole digital engagement and being able to travel the world. They love that. But you have a generational issue with the parents. The parents are stood behind them going, no, I'm not having you working in the cold shed or driving a truck. You're going to be an accountant or a banker or a consultant. So it's not just about engaging with the kiddies, it's, all, it's this going back a generation and doing a piece of work around the logistics industry with the general public at large. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Samuel, if I can just come in on, yes, on that yes. as well. Um, you know, the, whether we like it or not, the logistics industry has a, has a real perception 
problem in the, in the wider population. You know, we are seen as being low skilled and low paid. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that is that is the case. If you look at a lot of distribution centers, you know, there's been a, many in the in the news over the last few years where they have pretty appalling working conditions, uh, appalling uh, wages as well. And unless we actually address that from the, from the, the you know, foundations up, then we're never going to really change the perception of the industry, even as we know it that some sectors or some parts or some echelons of, of this industry are you know, a really interesting, really well paid and a great career. Uh, automation will help to address some of these issues, in, especially in warehouses in the, in the years to come. But there's no doubt, I mean, we firstly need to realise and, and understand ourselves that large parts of this industry are, have, have, a, have a real problem in terms of perception. And that's because of the, of the reality of working in parts of our, our industry. Okay. Um, I don't know if Richard wants to say something, but I was just going to pick up. Richard, do you want to say something on this? Um, so I'm I'm not an educator, so I um I okay. absolutely take on board um what yeah. Liam, Ed, and jo and John have said. Um, absolutely lifeblood to the industry. The industry is changing, uh, and it needs to change. Um, so we welcome anybody that can come in. Yeah, absolutely. A, a couple of quick uh, points from the chats and the questions. So it's it's very important. Somebody has raised a question about why do we call it industry? Why can't we call it a profession? And I think it's important that the language is that it's a career, it's a profession. And we have seen that from this COVID situation where, you know, the key, key people, key people who keep the, uh, the, the country running. And, and so I think we really need to bank, uh, or, you know, bank that particular perspective to say that it's a very, very important career uh, and, and just not an industry sector. Well, it is an industry sector, but I think from a, from a personal perspective or, or an individual perspective. But a uh, shout out to Novus. Novus program is great uh, in terms of, because I have been involved with that and it, it provides a guaranteed job offer with a certain, uh, of course, you, the, the individual has to get a certain degree, but a certain uh, score uh, at the end of the degree, but that's great. Uh, plus women in logistics, we are trying, to, you know, the, uh, you know, CILT and the other organizations are trying to get more uh, women and ethnic minorities involved into uh, this profession. Plus, you've got uh, Think Logistics, you've got Talent Logistics, you've got organizations like Business on the Move, and there are a number of such uh, um, organizations who are working very hard to try and get young people interested in the profession. Okay, changing the language uh, is very, very important to make it as a career option. But, uh, you know, because we're coming towards the end of this one hour, I know one hour is very short, but I want to kind of finish off to, you know, as a, as a kind of special mention perhaps a one minute mention from each one of you in terms of uh, how should the logistics sector prepare for the future you know uh, there is brexit on the horizon as soon as lockdown shuts down uh, you know uh, there is going to be brexit issues coming up there's going to be cross border scenarios there's going to be uh, people talking about queues of trucks everywhere and and ports uh, congested and all sorts of things so I, I know one minute is a very short time but what can you say in a minute uh, about logistics sector preparing for the future. Also, start with you, Richard. Oh, thank you, Samir. Um, uh, right, so preparing for the future. Um, uh, we're, we're not through this particular issue just yet. Um, I, I firmly believe there will be another phase. So that's my immediate future, making sure um, we and our network are in a position to cope with that. Um, so once we're through that, then it's into Brexit. Um, and I, you know, nobody really wants to talk about Brexit at the moment, but nope. um, that for my supply chain is about border delays. Um, and, and thereafter, it's, it's medium to longer term, it's about how we procure the services. So I think um, one of the biggest things I have learned in the last few weeks is our old-fashioned structured procurement techniques based on long-term stable relationships buying your strategic items and bottleneck items and so forth that approach needs modifying for this new environment we're in we're in a phase at the moment in a few months time we'll be in another phase and in a few months time if brexit happens we'll be in another phase 
and we've got to procure our services differently in that new environment. Um, and of course, people are at the heart of our business. So we've just had the discussion about industry profession. How do we get people in? Uh, our business will not function if there are not people behind steering wheels and not people here, um, picking product um, yeah. off shelves. And that's a really big thing, making sure they're safe and making sure they're valued. Um, so I think uh, uh, that's probably where my focus is. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I mentioned before that I think uh, as we unlock, we have um, windows of opportunity. I think that's in terms of our business practice, learning what we can from the last couple of months, particularly around more collaborative practices. Uh, we have a window of opportunity, certainly in terms of attracting uh, new talent uh, into the profession. I also noticed somebody in the chat has talked about freight blindness in the public sector. I think we also have a window of opportunity in terms of mm -hmm. making sure that freight and logistics and supply chain issues are given the recognition they deserve in terms of policy making uh, regionally uh, and nationally and even internationally. Excellent, thank you. John? Thanks, Samir. Yeah, I think um, these are all things that we've touched on within the conversation, but I think firstly, digitization of data will continue to be important, even more so in the, in the coming few years. Digitalization of markets, which will, this, will, uh, this will facilitate. Uh, automation of processes, which is again, well, something we've been talked about and specifically within the warehouse as well, far more use of automation and robotics. Uh, throughout the supply chain, we'll see more visibility. We'll see more collaboration between the supply chain partners, more collaboration with governments as well as there need to be in trade bodies as well to facilitate the movement of goods cross border. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, uh, more in terms of risk mitigation. So in terms of business continuity planning uh, and getting robust processes in place to deal with, with these sorts of events that we've just seen over the last uh, couple of months. We know they're going to occur. It may not be in a pandemic, it might be in, in a natural disaster of some sort or mm -hmm. any other or terrorist or, or any other uh, black swan, as Richard was uh, saying first off. But um, this, this is the future. So more resilience, uh, which all the things that I've talked about before, that that will enable. Yeah, uh, Liam, last one. Quick. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, most of it's already been covered. My, my thing's about the, the data. Right. Um, I, think, I think picking up on Richard's point, the, the positive from this is this is a dress rehearsal for Brexit. So if we can digitize our supply chains, I mean, we're talking about food, 54% of our food is imported. So we've got, and we've got policy people making policy decisions to pick up Ed's point in the dark because they're making policy decisions based on mass and balances and customs checks, not on real time data moving through a pipeline. So if we can get this digitization that John's talking about nailed, we'll have better policy, better movement of flows, better nutritious supply chains, and integration of the SMEs. And right. we'll all be Thank you. So I think we have to stop now. I know one hour was a short thing. Um, but it was great. Thank you very much to the panel. I think it has been a very lively and very important discussion. And if you do uh, have any questions or you want us to do another session, please do get back with uh, CILT or email any of us. So have a good day and thank you very much. Thank you, Samir. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. So Laura, now you're going to shut this.